Right, good day learners and welcome to another exam prep video where we are looking at the CAT grade 12 theory paper and this is from the IEB and this is your June theory paper. So um, we're going to see as we go through and for those of you who've been through the previous video I did which was uh, the DBE paper, um, you'll begin to see now as we go through this what the differences are between that paper and an IEB paper. So it's here to help you and I hope you make use of both. So you'll see this paper is also divided into three sections. Section A, which is comprised of 25 marks, section B, 75 marks, and section C, 50 marks, giving us our 150 mark paper. Okay, let's go through. Let's look at section A. So in section A, we're starting off with question number one. And you can see immediately the difference from the DBE is that here we are starting with the match the column. Now, the same principle that we used in the DBE is going to be exactly the same here. It's always good just to go through the terms and see what these things actually mean. See if anything comes back to your memory. Um, just have a good, you know, look through all of these. See, okay, orphan, widow, deep web anti-spyware, yes, UTPs, cabling, we've got shortcuts, we've got a few terms that we know like ATM, anti-spam, hot swapping, clock speed, um, that's our CPU speed, uh, tablets, okay, okay, so it's not, not too bad, <laughs> not too bad at all. Right, so let's go and look. The first one says, the most commonly used form of Ethernet cable and the minute I see cable I look at UTP and I look at STP what does that stand for unshielded twisted pair and shielded twisted pair both refer to cabling the most commonly used form of Ethernet cable in local area networks and that is going to be UTP unshielded twisted pair number two this is used to prevent unsolicited bulk email now unsolicited bulk email when we're talking about that what does that mean? That means spam, right? Just a whole lot of mails you didn't ask for. So spam email, is there anything that relates to spam? Yes, we've got anti-spam. So that's an anti-spam piece of software and it's used to prevent unsolicited bulk email. Then number three determines how quickly the CPU can execute basic instructions. That is our clock speed, right? We're talking about it um, being 3.7 gigahertz and things like that. That is our speed of our CPU. It's the speed um, at which it can execute basic instructions. Okay, so it's all fairly simple so far. Next one, a term given to the last line of a paragraph left by itself at the top of the next page. So the last line of that particular paragraph has gone over to the top of the next page. Now, if I go to my paragraph dialog box and I go to line and page breaks, do you see here? Widow orphan control, right? Um, I have an option for that. So when my text, where is it now? When my text goes to the next page, um, I have that last line that's sitting there by itself and that's going to be my widow. Number five, the part of the World Wide Web, so the internet, that is only accessible by means of special software. Hmm. Allowing users and website operators to remain anonymous or untraceable and make illegal transactions. Okay. So, immediately, I know it's not going to be any of these. I'm looking at dark web. I'm looking also at the deep web. Now, if we know the difference, and again, if you've been following um, on the YouTube shorts or my TikTok page, then you would have seen the, a video where I covered the difference between these two. Um, the deep web is where I am searching through the internet. I'm going into secure websites, you know, like maybe banking or things like that. And the dark web is where I need to, uh, where I will be going in via special software, where I want to remain anonymous and untraceable and unfortunately make illegal transactions so that answer is going to be dark web number six a keyboard shortcut used to undo your last action so there's a shortcut there's a shortcut and of those two control plus the letter z 
that is going to be to undo my last action. Okay, I hope you see how I'm approaching this. The next one, an example of a dedicated device. Well, we know a dedicated device does one specific task. That's going to be an ATM, right? Our ATMs, I don't see anything else here that relates to that. No, okay. So that's our ATM. Then an example of convergence. What is convergence? It's all different technologies or separate technologies that come together in one device. Can we see anything here that actually matches up with that? Of course we do. We see our tablet. What can we do on our tablet? We can record audio. We can record video. Um, we can do a number of different things on there. Separate technologies coming together in one device. Number nine, the function key. So immediately when they talk about the function key, I'm looking at my F keys here. So F4, and I'm looking at F5 as well. And they say a function key that can be used in setting absolute cell referencing. Ha! Now, you would know that. You would know that. Let me go and open Excel. Let me open Excel. And we're going to put in a function to test this out. So I have numbers. And I want to multiply that by 10%. And I say equals, take that amount, multiply it by, um, what is that reference, H5. H5, and I hit enter. And that's all fine until I copy it down. And then, oh, I said to the bit of a problem. I mean, there's no way 10% of 45 gives you 9,000. I mean, yeah, I'd love to be in that bank. <laughs> Okay, so what we're going to do then is we're going to go in here. That's the reference I want to keep, and I'm going to press F4. And do you see there? Absolute cell referencing. That means I can take it down, and there I've got my answer. So I know that it is F4. Okay, and then the last one for um, question number one. A method of connecting peripherals. So what's a peripheral? Something something outside of the system unit, something that connects to the system unit, a keyboard, speakers, a mouse, anything like that. So a method or way of connecting these peripherals to a computer whereby devices are plugged into the computer without switching the computer off. Okay, now it's, it's not referring to plug and play. Remember, plug and play is a feature that allows Windows to pick up what you've installed or what you've connected um, so that it can work with it. We're talking about a method of connecting these peripherals. And here's the key. Plugged into the computer without switching the computer off. That is hot swapping. When we talk about hot, we mean that the PC is still on. Okay, so that's our selection there. Number 10 is hot swapping. Right, then they've also added into question one, um, these five marks over here, and they want us to look at definitions. And again, two marks. We look at the mark allocation, two marks, two marks, one mark. And they want us to provide definitions for farming, for cyberbullying, and for ROM. So I want you to see again, like I did in the previous video, looking at the memo to see exactly how they want us to answer this. Now, we already know what farming is. We know what cyberbullying is. We know what ROM is. But let's see where we're going to get our two marks from. Here you can see farming is a scamming practice where a user is automatically redirected to another or a fake website when he or she types in the correct URL for the official site. So you could also say it's a scamming practice where you are automatically redirected to another site when you click on maybe a link that you receive. Uh, that's going to give you one mark. The second mark, the criminal is then able to use any data the user enters, like passwords or pins. Okay, So that's how we get our two marks from farming. Cyberbullying, there you can see. It includes the spreading of rumors, gossip, and general bullying of another person. That's one mark. Using digital methods or using online methods. 
or using the internet as a communication method, you know, anything like that. But that's how you are going to get your two marks from cyberbullying. Then ROM, it's one mark. And all they are saying here is expand the acronym. Are they saying to you, explain anything? No. You are just expanding what these three letters stand for, and that is read-only memory. Okay, good. Now we move on to question two. So here we are with question two, and we now have a multiple choice section. So already in question one, you could see the slight difference between DBE and IEB. Let's look at the multiple choice of question number two. And our first question says, which generation of mobile technology? Now remember, when we look at these options, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, what does that stand for the second generation, third generation? One is just faster and better than the one before it. Okay, that's, that's really all it is. So here they say, which generation of mobile cellular technology is also known as LTE, or our long-term evolution? And that we should know is our fourth generation. So most of us have phones that can take 3G, then we had 4G and LTE, and then there's the move towards 5G as well. Right, number two, you have a five terabyte hard drive. You back up your Blu-ray movies. Okay, so Blu-ray movies, we're talking about somewhere between 4.7 gigs um, and higher, okay? So you back up your Blu-ray movies and each, oh yeah, they tell us is about 25 gigs in size. So each Blu-ray movie is 25 gigs. How many approximately could you fit onto the hard drive before it's nearly full? Now, when we've got a five terabyte hard drive, what does that actually mean? Remember, we have gigs. We have 1,024 gigs that makes up five, sorry, that makes up one terabyte. So we would have to multiply that by five in order to get our answer there. And I'm not going to do all the calculations now, but that would work out to roughly around 200. So you'd first have to take your 1024 gigs, multiply that by five to get um, in gigs this size. And let me just... 1024 times 5, that's going to give me 5,120 gigs. And then I'm going to take that and I'm going to divide that by 25. And it gives me 204,8. So that's why we'll choose B, which is the closest to that. Right. Number three, computers with vast amounts of computing power that perform activities such as weather or nuclear simulations, ah, there's our clue, are called what? Are they servers? No, because a server provides services to a network. It's usually fairly small networks, and you, you don't have massive amounts of computing power for that. The servers provide these services to clients, which are even smaller computers with even less processing power. So these two are already out. Then we have our mainframes and we have our supercomputer. So which of the two do you think it is? Well, when we are talking about vast amounts of computing power to do like weather forecasts or nuclear simulations, then we are going to go with our supercomputer. Okay, number four, which one of the following is an open question? So what is an open question? It means um, people can put in their opinions or things like that. If it's a closed question, then it's just yes, no, or choosing from um, the options that they are giving us. So let's see, which, sorry, where am I now? A, which should the school build, a gym or an astroturf? What do we have, one option or the other? Why do you favor building a gym over there? That's your opinion. Would you use the gym? If it was built, yes or no? If the gym was built, would you give up your current gym membership? Yes or no? Do you see? Closed question. Closed question. Closed question. So the only one that matches up would be B. Then 2.1.5. Someone receives a chain letter. Ah, you know these things. Chain letter via email and sends it to 10 of their friends. This is called what? 
Retweet him? No, because I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> am I copying and pasting it? No. I'm just taking it and I am forwarding it. And please don't forward chain letters and emails. Yeah, nobody likes those things. All right, number six. You wish to send an email to 100 recipients. They must not see each other's email addresses. Which option will achieve this most efficiently? Are you going to send a separate email to your a separate email to 100 people? Um, no, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. If I use the CC, it means the folks are going to see who it's been copied to, which means I'm only left with the option of BCC or my blind carbon copy that I'm going to be using. Number seven. Ah, you see? Yeah, some of the differences now. Yeah, we talk about the topology, the topology of a network. In other words, the structure of the net network. How was it actually set up? And we have different ones like our line topology, our bus topology, our tree topology, and our ring topology. And here we have computers, and I can already see what it is, because here we have computers that looks like it's in a line, right? But this is not that. Um, you also see these little gray things at the end. Those are what we call terminators. So it's sort of stopping or just keeping everything within this um, line of media. And that is going to be my bus topology. Okay, number eight. Look at the screenshot below and answer the questions that follow. So what do I have here? I've got an Excel spreadsheet. Um, I've got headings. I've got info. Right. Which one of the following would correctly generate the codes in column E? Now, when I look at that code, what do I see? I see a capital letter R for Richard. I see Brad from his surname Bradfield. So they've taken the first letter of the name. They've taken the next one, two, three, four letters of the surname. And they've taken one, two, three, four. These numbers over here from the ID number to make up a code. Okay. So that means if I just look at this, they've taken the first letter from the left starting in cell A2. So equals left. So immediately this one that says right, immediately that one is gone, right? That one's out of the equation completely. Um, left B2. Now that's also wrong because we're talking about A2. So equals A2, comma 1. That means that we're going to start counting from the left in cell A2, and we want the first character. We just want one character. So we're taking that. That's over there. That's all fine. Then in B2, I want to take also from the left, one, two, three, four characters. Ah, there's my answer. My answer is going to be A. So first character from the left of A2, first four characters from the left of B2, then from the middle of C2, I want... Um, from 3 to 4, and then I've got all that being put together. Okay, 2.1.8, that is A. Uh, number 9, in column F, column F, there's nothing. You would like to use a function to check the ID numbers, from, okay, from column C. Check that they are the correct length. They must be 13 digits. Which one of the following options would you would you use to do this correctly? So um, for this one, we know we're going to use our text functions right? that we have here. And we're going to use equals len. That's going to give us the length of the characters in cell C2. So equals len C2 is going to be my answer. And then the last one to round off not only question 2, but also section A. Um, number 10, the cell numbers in column D, right, were at first not showing a zero at the beginning of a number. And you already know where I'm going with this. Which one of the following format cells options was used to correct this? Number, general number, accounting, or text? Well, I've still got Excel open here. So let's go and find out. Um, I'm just going to put any number in there. And you can see the zero doesn't display. So what I can do... I've got different options, but for the purpose of this, I'm going to change it to text. I'm going to pop in my zero. 
and there you can see the proof right so my option is going to be d text and guys that is now section a dealing with question one and two and now we move on to section b and we're starting off with question number three and now we're looking at system technologies and we saw with the dbe paper when we deal with system technologies we're looking at um you know a lot of the hardware understanding hardware specs um, and getting a lot of questions based off of that so let's go and see what they want us to do now this is something you'll see coming through very commonly um, in the ieb papers where they are wanting us to be able to identify through obviously visuals um, the different technologies that we have and so yeah they're going to ask us usually they'll ask us for the device and the function so it's not just enough to say well that's a motherboard that's a sim card that's a power supply and that's a vr headset um, you must be able to actually explain what that does okay so 3.1.1 we already know that is our power supply unit and what does it do well it supplies power to the motherboard and all the components in the computer end of story okay 3.1.2 that is our VR headset, right? So it's a virtual reality headset. And what does it do? It provides virtual reality to the wearer. That's it, okay? That, that's all you need to say. Remember, this is one mark, one mark. One mark to name it, one mark for the main function. They're not asking for a paragraph of information, guys. Please, just bear that in mind. Then the next one, this one over here, what is that going to be 3.1.3 that is a sim card what does a sim card do well it enables communication between the phone and the service provider that's it okay <laughs> um, yes you can say it also stores information such as phone numbers security data etc but it basically enables communication between the phone and the service provider because without the sim card you can't do anything right and then 3.1.4, we've got our motherboard. And what are we going to say about that? It is a large circuit board that other components are plugged into. You can also say um, the motherboard holds together many of the crucial components of the computer. You can say it's the largest circuit board inside our system unit. Um, you know, anything along those lines. So that is very typical. And it's, it's good even if you're not doing the IEB papers, you're doing DBE. It's good to understand. This gives you a solid understanding when it comes um, to your hardware devices. All right, 3.2, load shedding. Ah, typical one. Load shedding has made a UPS an important investment. What is a UPS? And that's probably the first question. Expand the acronym. That is your uninterrupted power supply. Now, it's, it's very nice to have this, but please, when we see this, just understand that it's not an inverter, right? Um, a UPS is going to give us, it's going to keep our devices powered on, but for a short space of time. And the whole idea is that we are able to just switch off everything we need to correctly, right? It gives us the time to do that. So yes, it stands for uninterrupted power supply. An advantage of that is that um, it provides us with surge protection it provides us with protection against spikes as well okay when it comes to power when we look at how it works well it basically sits between and let me see if i can just get a while i'm here we can just get a picture of how a ups works so you can see for yourself um ups So here we have a typical example of what a UPS looks like, right? And that UPS would be plugged into the mains. Um, I actually want to see if I can just get a simple. I know these folks always like putting in very dramatic and difficult examples, very complicated examples of um, a UPS, but Basically, it would just be plugging into the wall and it's charging from the wall and then your device, whether it's your laptop or your desktop or anything like that, 
um, that would then be plugged into the UPS. So when the power is cut from ESCOM, okay, let me see. No, yeah, so when the power is cut um, from ESCOM, you can actually still keep running. So here, for example, um, there with what is a UPS, let's say this is ESCOM, they're providing power. This is your UPS, you'd be plugged into that. So if this goes down, you are still running off that battery. Again, it's not there designed to keep you running for like hours and hours. That's what the inverters and other things like that do. But it's enough time so that you can actually shut down your equipment properly. 3.3, an operating system, firmware or system software exists on all computers and computing devices. That's just a statement. Most of these provide a GUI. What's a GUI? A graphical user interface. What does that mean? Remember, our GUI is the ability for us to actually interact with the software or with our computer using visual elements. So things like icons and your desktop and things like that. So most of these provide a GUI for better user interface and basic security. Now I've just said what a GUI is, okay? So it's our graphical user interface. It allows us to interact with the system um, by providing visual elements. And then you can give a few examples of that as well. Um, what input device is best to use with a GUI? Well, we know from grade 10, we were told that the keyboard is not the best thing to use, rather the mouse. Okay, so the mouse would be um, the best device to use there. And then as usual, they ask us for um, examples of how an operating system provides you with a basic level of security. Well, when I log into my PC, what happens? It's asking me for a username and password. Um, when I plug flash drives in, it wants us to check the flash, the flash drive, maybe scan it, things like that. So um, you can say, you know, user and password control. Some of the laptops have biometric control where you can um, scan. In fact, your phones as well. Um, you know, you've got all those security features. Uh, what else? Asking for access rights to your device before installing software, controlling and preventing malware, checking the programs, all those types of things. So you can list uh, any of those. Okay, here's another big one. Your grandfather's concerned that many of his old photos are fading fast, and I can already see a scanner coming through here. He asks if you could help him preserve those memories. You explain that you can copy or save them to your computer. Now, other than your computer, number one, what piece of hardware will be required for this? And that is, as I just mentioned earlier, that's going to be our scanner. Number two, what setting or capability on this devices, software or hardware, can have an important impact on the quality of the electronic image. What is this actually saying? This is asking me what setting, and we're talking about the scanner now, now that we've established that, what setting on the scanner is going to impact the quality of the image? Well, it's going to be the resolution. Remember, anything that deals with the quality, even with our monitors, we said that was our resolution. Number three, Will you require OCR software? Now we stop there. What is OCR software? It stands for Optical Character Recognition Software. What does it do? Well, remember what it does. It converts our scanned image into editable text. We can now actually edit um, what we are working on. So here yeah, they're asking us, will you require this kind of software to perform the task? Do you think so? No. Why am I not going to need it? Because I'm scanning in photos. I'm not scanning in documents. Okay, I hope you're with me. Number four, name two file types or extensions that the photos might be saved as or converted to. Well, we've got a number of them. Um, it can be .jpg. I'm actually going to show you that .jpg. Um, you can have .png. You can have .gif. Oh, there's a number of them. Okay, so any of those two. Once all the images are converted and saved, you want to save them as one large PDF file. Describe one way in which you could achieve this objective. Okay, well, one way that you can do it is to take all those photos, copy and paste them, or just insert them into a Word document, put them all the way through your Word document, and then save that Word document as a PDF. Simple. That's it. Okay. If you have another way and it makes sense, then you can use that. 
Right, 3.5, when computers run short of RAM, they utilize virtual memory. At the time of recording this, I've just done a, a, a TikTok on this, um, explaining what virtual memory is. So remember, when your computer's running low on RAM, it may access free disk space on the hard drive. This is where it loads programs and processes there and allows it to run more programs at the same time. So virtual memory is where your computer's taking, it's now used up all its RAM. It's looking for more space to load, you know, the programs and instructions. So it takes a piece of the hard drive's space to use as virtual memory. Okay, and that's where we get our two marks, and that's our 27 marks for question three. Right, moving on, question number four, we're now dealing with internet uh, technologies and our networks. So here we go. Question number four, network printing, what does that mean? That means I'm going to be using the network facility to be able to print. Now that would often mean that I haven't got a physical printer plugged into my PC, but there is a printer that all the PCs may be in a library setting or so, are connected to okay so network printing allows you to print to a printer as i just said now not directly connected to your device an important part number one of allowing this in a wired network is a switch so explain what a switch is by explaining how it helps with network printing so again i want you to get the correct explanation see what they say from the memo there they tell us the printer is not directly connected to the, to the computer a switch is a network device which allows communications between devices on a wired network why are we saying on a wired network because with a switch you, you've got to plug in physical cables into it okay so that's your one mark the second mark comes from it allows for network printing as a computer can communicate with the printer and send it data for printing okay so that is how we end up getting our two marks now guys you don't have to word it exactly like that but something similar number two in a wired network what cable or port will the printer require well it's going to require a network port and please don't say that because that's just a casual way of, of talking about it it is an ethernet cable or an ethernet port. Remember we saw in our first question, they spoke about the most commonly used ethernet cable. So please use that ethernet. Number three, when a printer is connected onto a network, it receives an IP address. Explain what this is and why it is needed. Now we know an IP address is assigned to every computer on an ethernet network. What does it do? identifies you it identifies each computer on the network and what does it do further than that well it helps traffic flow between computers because each one has their own unique ip address so um, for this one we can just say uh, number one uh, an ip address is assigned to every computer on the network it identifies them on the network and as a result it helps with the traffic flow between computers. That's how I'm going to get my two marks. 4.1.4, explain how it is possible to have network printing on a WLAN. What is a WLAN? It is a wireless local area network. So how is it possible to have network printing? Well, all devices on the network are connected via Wi-Fi through to a router. And this acts like a switch, allowing all devices to communicate with each other using those IP addresses. So instead of us now going through a wired network to get to that printer, that printer is still going to be connected physically somewhere. It's still going to be connected, um, you know, via cable through some sort of a switch. But where you are connecting to, you are connecting wirelessly to a wired network. And that is how you are then able to gain access to that. Right, let's look at our next scenario. 4.2, John gets a job in China for six months. He calls his girlfriend on Skype daily because, they, uh, because both use their tablets 
for this. Okay, that's that's nice for John. <laughs> well done, John. 4.2.1. What technology does Skype use for John to be able to call over the internet? Call over the internet. Voice and video going over the internet. We know what protocol and what technology is used. It is VoIP, right? Voice over internet protocol. All right. Well done, John. Number two, name two things that John and his girlfriend need to have besides their tablets or devices to be able to allow them to use Skype in this way. Well, first of all, they are going to need Skype. I mean, you can't Skype call without Skype. It's like saying I'm going to do have a WhatsApp call without having WhatsApp. So the first thing, it seems fairly obvious, guys, but you need to put that down. The first thing is they actually need the Skype software. And secondly, what else do they need? They need data. They need the internet. They need some sort of internet connection, okay? So as much as it seems uh, like a very simple answer, this, this is really all they are asking us, okay? Number three, give one possible challenge they may sometimes face when using Skype. Well, if they are needing the internet, you could have connectivity issues, you could have quality issues, um, you could have slow internet, you know, anything like that. I mean, you know what a WhatsApp call is like. Sure. <laughs> Number four, to finish that off, Give a reason why you think it makes sense for John to use Skype in this way. Why would it make sense? Well, they both have an internet connection. They both have the Skype software. So it makes it simpler and easier. Plus, it's cheaper and more convenient to make calls that way. Okay. That brings us then to 4.3. And that is here is where we're going to round off question number four now. So web browsers. What is a web browser? A web browser is a piece of software that allows us to navigate over the internet. So our web browsers like Google Chrome, Firefox, Safari, um, they are used, sorry, they are central to our use of the internet. Explain what a web browser is and give the name of a web browser currently available. I just did that. <laughs> okay. So a web browser is a software application that allows you to browse over the internet or to browse and navigate through the internet and view web pages, etc. And you could give any example like Microsoft Edge, Opera, Safari, Chrome, Firefox, you know, anything like that. Anything that is a piece of software and that allows you to check out what's on the internet. Then you need to explain why browsers, and it's one mark, guys, guys, one mark, okay? No long paragraphs, please. Explain why browsers are important in cloud computing. Why are they important? Well, as the software, because when you do cloud computing, you can access via the browser. So as you don't have the software physically on your computer, you need an interface with which to interact with the software. And this is the done through the browser. So the browser is the interface through which you access this cloud computing. When I use Google Drive, when I use Google Docs, Google Sheets, I need a browser as a way to interact uh, or as the interface for the cloud computing. And that's question four. Right, question number five, information management. Um, this is not a long one. This is just a couple of marks, 12 marks or so. They give us a nice scenario. Information management. So let's have a look. You belong to a charity which is starting a library as an education outreach project. So just bear that in mind. Many books have been secured by and donated to the charity. These books will need to be cleaned, collated, catalogued, and packed onto the library's shelves. The project coordinator has decided to use a computer program, so a piece of software and obviously a computer to work on it, um, to keep track of all the items, both those that are on loan and those that are not. Okay, um, a lot of unnecessary information here, but anyway... Let's see as we go through. 5.1, give three important pieces of data that should or could be used in the cataloging of each book. Now, you can give any three pieces. So things like the author, the book title, the genre. Okay, those of you who are library monitors and things like that, yeah, I know you're going to give me a whole lot of other things, but they only want three important pieces of info. So it could be the publisher, the edition number, the ISBN number, whatever you want to put in, but any three of those. Then 5.2, once the data has been collated and cataloged, give three processes or queries that can be done with the data. 
Well, once we've punched all of that in, we can sort that info according to genre. We can sort that info according to the author. We can search for a particular genre. We can then um, pull a query to see whether a particular book has been allowed to be borrowed or not. Um, we can see who the maybe the most popular author or what the most popular genre is. We can do any of those. Okay, then for two marks, and I want to show you this because it is a very simple explanation. 5.3, give the definition of an algorithm and have a look at this. One line, one sentence, two marks. It is a step-by-step, -step, or you can use the word sequential, set of instructions to solve a problem. A step-by-step -step set of instructions to solve a problem. That is an algorithm. Done. That's it. There's, there's like nothing else needed for that. And then 5.4, explain the difference between information and data. So we know data is a raw fact. It has no meaning on its own. When we talk about information, we're talking about processed data. There is meaning behind it. And then we need to refer to the scenario above to better assist with our explanation. So yes, data is raw facts. It has no meaning on its own. And I actually, let's, let's, just, let's just have a look at this so you can see how they would like it worded. So the first two marks, data is raw and has no meaning of its own. It consists of a collection of facts, statements, or numbers. That's one mark. The next one is when processed, sorted, and filtered, or you can just say when processed, they produce understanding and meaning, which is defined as information. Right? There we go. That's the first two marks. The second two marks, to earn these marks, the learner must use examples um, from the library. So um, here you will have to, again, like they said, refer to the scenario and give examples from that. So do you see your definition, or your explanation of the difference between the two counts for two, the rest is going to be um, from you actually using examples from the scenario. Okay, and that is question five. Now we move on to question six, social implications. And here they give us um, a scenario again. They say to us, look at the example of a message generated by a form of malware called WannaCry. Um, and there we can see the piece of software. We can see what's happening here. Um, yeah, malware, malicious software, harmful software. Sure. Send $300 worth of Bitcoin to this address. Wow. Okay, nice. <laughs> Not going to be doing that. Right, so 6.1.1, explain what malware type this is by referring to the image above. So what is this? This is ransomware. How do I know this? Well, it's a piece of software that's locking my files and it will only decrypt them if I pay. So it's holding my files for ransom. So ransomware. Okay. Number two, give two reasons why people would demand Bitcoin as payment. Well, first of all, it's anonymous. So it, it protects the identity um, of the criminal. And secondly, it is easy to transfer. Right? It's easy to move around. 6.1.3, this type of malware is usually transmitted through phishing attacks. Why are people still falling victim to phishing attacks? Well, there's going to be a few, ex a few reasons. Um, when it comes to phishing, remember, what are they doing? They try, these criminals are trying to look like legitimate sources and they are trying to bait you. They are trying to give you something that looks legitimate so that you can click on it, so that you can go to the site, so that you can, you know, do something in order um, for them to get your details. So it often seems like a legitimate request coming from a legitimate source. And this is why people fall for it. Um, they often play on the human emotions. You know, people respond to greed, fear, and ignorance. So when they tell you that you've won the lotto and it's to someone who's in, you know, dire financial um, difficulties, then what do you think is going to happen? They are going to click on those links. Okay. And then I've just explained 6.1.4 um, how this phishing happens. You get 
an SMS, you get an email to say that you've won this, you need to actually click on the link, provide your details, and you do that and nothing happens further and now they have your details. Okay, then considering your answer in question 6.1.4, give one online practical tip to ensure that your browsing experience is a safer one. Well, the first thing you're going to do is don't give out your personal details. Stay informed. Don't be gullible. Don't click on links and pop-ups. Only use trusted software. These are just some of the examples and you only need to use one. And then we move on to the last question for section B, question seven, and that's solution development. Now we already know with solution development, we are going to get a number of questions that relate to practical work. Okay, and in this I can already see the infamous Microsoft Access. So, yeah, they say to us some of the fields stored in a database can be seen in the table below. Copy the table in your answer book and fill in the blank cells. Under data type, over here, select the most appropriate data type for each field. Under validation, select which one of the fields should employ a validation rule and which one an input mask. And then they want us to justify our choices. Okay. So let's have a look at this. A cell phone number. Hmm. What do you think that's going to be? That's going to be text, right? Our data type there is going to be text. Um, do I need an input mask or validation rule? Well, I'm going to go with input mask. Why? Because I can put in 10 zeros, which is going to ensure that the person puts in 10 compulsory numbers. Gender. They don't give me a data type over there, or they've already got that. They want to know, should they use a validation rule or an input mask? Well, I'm going to use a validation rule so that I can say M or F. And then um, the validation text will go with that to then respond if the person doesn't use or doesn't follow that particular rule. What about salary? That's going to be monetary value, so I'm going to use currency. What about an employee photograph? That's where I'm going to use an OLE object, and this is for attachments. Okay, All right, we're progressing very nicely. 7.2, another field is added to the database described in 7.1 called employee types. The lookup wizard is selected as the data type. That means I'm going to put in like some sort of a combo box. Right. So what is the result of using this? As I just said, you'll create a combo box or list box in the grid sheet view or in the data sheet view where um, the user will then be able to choose between a number of options. How is this used to assist with data validation? Well, it means that they can only choose specific items. They are not able to choose anything else. Right, in the grid below, there are six fields that might be used together in a database table. To which field would it be most appropriate to assign the primary key? Now, what is a primary key? Please remember, primary key is supposed to be the most unique field within the list of items that we have there. I'm sorry, but do you think your name is unique? It's not. Okay. Uh, apologies there, <laughs> but it's not. Uh, surname? No. PIN chosen by the client? No. Um, date of birth? You think you're the only one born <laughs> on your date of birth? No. <laughs> your cell number? No. We've seen other people. <laughs> oh, this is so funny. Um, people... Yeah, sometimes I get SMSs from people who I don't even know, and then these companies are saying, I'm Mr. So-and-so, or I'm Mrs. So-and-so. Uh, my cell number has clearly been used somewhere else. The one that's supposed to be the unique, most unique one there um, that nobody else is supposed to have is your ID number. Okay, so why? Because it is unique to everyone in the population. It's not repeatable. You can't transfer it. That is going to be my choice. And then apart from a spreadsheet document, what other source can be used to perform a mail merge in a word processing document? Well, what you have in front of you here, a database table or a database query or a table in a word processing document, anything like that, um, that can be used there as well. And this is how I get my 12 marks for question seven. And that brings me to the end of section B.
Right, so now we are in section C and we've got question eight and I think question nine. No, just question eight. Okay, right, so let's look at question eight. This, like with the DBE, um, the last one is usually a massive integrated scenario. So you do want to take note of the scenario, get it into your head, understand it, process it, and then let's answer the questions. So they say to us here, Value Mart is a supermarket chain located in your city. Process that first. It's got five branches. So now it's in five different areas in your city. You are the IT, you are in the IT department and provide support to the head office and all the stores, okay? Just think about that first. The stores are all networked. So now we're dealing with probably a metropolitan area network because we are in different geographical areas within one city, okay? The stores are networked, they have an intranet. Now what is an intranet? This is an internet-like environment within the organization itself. So only people within the company can access that, right? But it's a website-like environment. Okay, and all data is centralized on a server at the head office. So the head office has the server, it networks out to the different branches. So whatever changes they make at the head office will reflect at the different branches. So that is our scenario. Let's go and have a look at the questions. The owner, 8.1, of ValueMart is considering the use of devices for various staff members to do functions on the shop floor. Look at the device's specifications below and answer the questions that he has asked. Okay, so we have device A. We've got a tablet. Um, we've got a neon tablet over here. We've got um, another tablet and then we've got a phone. So let me just zoom out quickly and let's have a look at these devices. This is 7-inch. 10 inch, 5 inch, um, dual SIM, this has got 3G, okay, let's see, quad core processor, Android, front camera, dual SIM, battery, storage, 8 gigs, expandable up to 8 gigs, Wi-Fi, we can see the price tag on that. The 10 inch is obviously going to be a lot more expensive, but this has got 4 gigs of RAM, it's got an octa-core, which should be 8 core processor, instead of quad meaning 4, uh, four uh, core processor so it should have doubled the processing speed it's got half the amount of ram it's got more storage expandable up to that um, eight megapixel primary camera much better than that five megapixel sorry yeah primary camera and then your five megapixel front camera much better than that um, different battery yeah so you can see why it's priced like that and then we've got the phone, which has front-facing camera of 5 megapixels. That's the same. Main camera, slightly less. Uh, it is smaller. It's got a dual SIM. Hmm, something was missing here. Something was missing here. Okay. Um, Android, two-year warranty, one gig of RAM, and a battery. That's a bit better than that one. Okay. Okay, okay, let's see. Let's see what they actually want from us. Well, first things first, they ask which device has the most memory. And that we can see is going to be device B. And that has four gigs of memory. That is going to be a device B as it has four gigs gigs of memory okay let's go here they ask us and it's it's what i said when i was looking at this 8.1.2 what is an octa-core processor what is an octa-core processor what does that mean right what did i say earlier it means it is a processor with eight cores that's what i said quad meaning four oct meaning eight okay um, what does it mean? Number three, what does it mean if you say that storage is expandable? It means that the amount of storage can be increased. We can add to what it already has. Okay, sometimes it's by means of, uh, you know, a little um, memory card that you can add in so that it can read up to 
um, that amount of storage. Okay, so that sorts that out. All right, let's continue. This is a big one. What item is needed if you do want to expand storage? <laughs> exactly. Guys, do you, do you see how I'm reading this? Do, do you see how I'm approaching this? I'm, I'm already thinking ahead without even thinking ahead. Okay, so what am I going to need if I want to expand storage on one of these devices? Well, I'm going to need an SD card. Okay, that's what I'm going to need. Number five, what is the difference between device A and device C in terms of screen size? Device A and device C in terms of screen size. Well, this display size is 5 inch and this display size is 7 inch. So what's the difference? Well, device A is larger by 2 inches than device C, right? Number six, how can you physically check the screen size of your device? Well, how do we measure the size of any screen? We measure the size um, diagonally in inches. That's how we do that. Okay, that's actually how we get our two marks. Diagonally in inches. Okay, number seven, which device has the battery with the most capacity? Let's go and have a look. Battery, um, 2,400. Then we've got a battery with 2,600. And here we have a 6,000 um, milliamp battery. So obviously device B is going to be the one that has the battery with the most capacity. Number eight. How do you physically check the screen size? Oh, sorry. I'm reading the wrong one here. Um, describe two things that can be done to lengthen the life of a battery um, charge in a phone or tablet. And what are we what are what are we going to be looking at? Well, we want to turn the screen brightness down. We want to switch off Wi-Fi or Bluetooth if we don't need it. We can um, get rid of you know those push notifications. We can turn off vibration because every time the phone rings or a message comes through and it vibrates. Um, it's actually taking battery life. You can turn the sound down. Um, yeah, there are there are a number of features that you can actually use. And then 8.1.9, without being able to demo or try out or physically handle these devices, give two ways that we might use the World Wide Web or the Internet to be able to have some idea or opinion about them, besides just looking at the specifications or what the manufacturer says about them. Well, I can go and read um, reviews online. I can go watch some YouTube videos to see if people have bought this and what their um, you know, viewpoint on it is. I can go and read independent reviews from maybe tech magazines or tech websites. So I can do any um, of those that will actually help me out. Right. Let's look at the next one. Look at the spreadsheet screenshots below and answer the following questions. So there I've got a spreadsheet. Figure one, figure two. People who work in the store during COVID are entitled to additional compensation. Column F. The scale of remuneration is held on a separate sheet called compensation. The table array is seen in figure two. Look at the options below and answer the questions. So let's look at this. We've got VLOOKUP and then it's D2 compensation. So we're looking up, we're saying our lookup value is D2 salary. Remember, our lookup value has to be something that's in both of these, right? Is salaried and wage and that there? Yes, it is. So D2 is correct. So up until this point, everyone is fine. Then compensation, personnel and compensation. They said to us that this is a separate spreadsheet called compensation. So the first thing we should see here is compensation because we are using our lookup value to go to this particular table array and go and check it out. Right, so option number three is definitely going to be wrong. Then let's, let's, let's just continue to look here. Um, so VLOOKUP is fine, D2 is fine, compensation is fine. Then our table array you can see these have the absolute cell reference this one does not is that going to be a problem 
Yes, it is because I'm going to want to copy it down. So option four is definitely not going to be an option because I don't have the absolute cell referencing. Okay, um, two is fine. And then what I'm left with then is option one and option two. But do you see the difference between them? I've got false and I've got true over here. Right. And if I want an exact match with exact figures, I'm going to have to use false. And that's why I can't use true. And that then means that I'm only going to work with option number one. Okay, so let's look at our questions now 8.2.1. Explain why the mistake in option two would make the output for parts of column F correct, uh, incorrect. Well, we said it's because they're using that true option. Um, and this is when we are dealing with a range of options or values. And in this case, we're not. Question two says, explain the problem in option three. Well, we already know that that's a problem because it's referring to a worksheet that doesn't exist. Okay. Then number three, explain the problem in option four. We already know that one. Um, it doesn't have the absolute cell referencing. So we can't fill it down. We can't use autofill. So that's also a problem. And then they ask us, instead of using VLOOKUP, name another function that you could use. Well, if we look at this, um, and I've got criteria, well, different criteria, I can possibly use a nested if function. Okay, so let's go to 8.3. Now, 8.3 is another scenario, and they say, remember, we are still in the scenario of the stores and you are IT, etc. Five problems have been logged with the IT department by one of the stores. So your store is phoned in, told you they've got five issues, and you are visiting them to try and sort out those issues. So here's issue number one. And if I go down, you'll see that we need to come up with a cause and a possible solution. So a possible cause. So we, we are trying to ascertain what is actually going on here and how we could possibly solve the problem. We're not always going to get it 100% correct. But let's see what we can do. 8.3.1, a monitor in the manager's office is not displaying well. Now, if it's not displaying well, there's only a few things that can actually be a problem. The cable, the monitor itself, the signal that it's getting. Do they give us any further info? It says it seems to be tinted yellow. Now, that won't be the screen itself. That will most likely be the cable. So... Um, we could say there that the problem is the connection, connector, you know, cable, something like that. Possible solution? Well, we could change the cable. We could see that the cable is seated correctly, that it's plugged in properly. Um, if that doesn't work, then could be a problem on the monitor itself. Okay, next one. One of the old computers is using a traditional old hard drive. And it's becoming increasingly slow and unresponsive. So the first thing we want to check is, is the hard drive full? We want to check is the hard drive still in good work in order? Um, we want to see maybe if there's not files that are fragmented all over the place. Those could be possible causes. As a result, some solutions could be running a disk defragmenter, running a scan disk, and maybe ultimately replacing that hard drive with an SSD. And those are all different options that you could use there. The next one gives us quite a bit of information. It says we've got a wired keyboard. Now remember, a wired keyboard is gonna plug in via USB. It's not responding at all. The staff have unplugged it and reinserted the cable. So they've tried that same port. They've tried a different port and they've rebooted the machine. Well, at that, at that point, you throw the keyboard away. <laughs> uh, nothing has worked. So what's the problem? The problem is the keyboard. The problem is the keyboard. Now, because it's more... It's going to cost you more to repair than to replace. And most people don't really go out and repair keyboards unless it's like a very expensive keyboard. Um, you just replace the keyboard. Next one. One of the network printers is not working. Now, a network printer, think about this. A network printer is connected directly to the network. So it's just got the network cable. It's got the power cable. And then you've got a network path that you've got to follow to actually print to that. It's plugged in. So we know that. It's switched on. Right, so it's working, yet nothing is happening. What do you mean? What's what? Uh, nothing is happening. It means I can't print to it. So maybe the person's not connected to that printer. Maybe they are pointed to the incorrect printer. Those could all be causes. The solution? Well, I can point it to the correct one. I can connect it to that network to network printer. Um, if it is already, 
you know, connected to it. Maybe I'm going to need to reinstall the driver. Maybe I need to point it, make sure it's pointing to the correct printer, you know, anything like that. And then the last issue was the projector in the meeting room. It's not working. The power light comes on, which means it's, it's switching on this power. It's connected to the computer, so that's fine. The correct input or source is selected, so that's fine. And they know the cable is working. Nothing is being projected onto the screen. Well, if all that is taken into consideration, then the only possible solution is that the bulb has reached the end of its life or it is fused. And we need to either replace the bulb or the entire projector depending on cost. Right. Next one, 8.4. Moving forward with our scenarios. And yeah, they say Value Mart has an acceptable use policy. Remember what that is? That's the policy that indicates how you are going to be using the ICT services of a particular company, um, which all employees must sign. But an employee is confused about the difference between an AUP and an EULA. So then they ask us for four marks to explain the difference between the AUP and the EULA. Now I'm going to stop there. An EULA, end user license agreement, that's a legally binding contract between myself and the software company, you know, the company that, that owns the software that I'm installing on my computer. You know, when you go through software, you go next, 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 and you go agree, right? That's a legally binding agreement between you and the software company that owns the software, indicating how I may or may not use that software. That's an EULA. That's one mark. An AUP is a policy that says how, what I'm permitted or not permitted to do with the ICT resources of a company. So that's how I'm getting my two marks. The only way I get the other two marks is by providing an example of something that might be contained in each of these, right? And I need to, uh, that will help highlight the difference. So an AUP, hmm, well, maybe the AUP of the company says I can't um, use the resources of the company for piracy or for cyberbullying. The EULA, maybe in the agreement it says I may not modify the source code of the software. Those are all examples. Okay, and that's that's essentially how we get our four marks. Now they ask in 8.5, the company's branches are networked to each other across the city, which they mentioned right at the beginning of question eight. What kind of network is this best described as? I remember saying this to you. I remember giving you this answer right at the beginning when we spoke about the fact that it's located in your city, it's got five branches that are all within your city, and I said that this is within a metropolitan area, so it's going to be a metropolitan area network. It is a network over many different locations, but still within one um, metropolitan area or one city. Right, we're heading closer to the end. Each store, 8.6, has a proxy server. So a proxy server stands in between your company's network and the internet. Okay, that's where a proxy server is located. Now, give two reasons why they might be using a proxy server. Well, for security. Security for what? Security in the form of a firewall. Security to filter and monitor what's coming into the network and what's going out of the network. Right? Maybe even providing caching services. Any, any of those type of um, services would be provided by the proxy server. Then 8.7, the head office uses a web server. Now, what does a web server do? We use a web server for web hosting, for hosting websites. So when you access any website, you are actually accessing a web server that contains that particular site. Why would the head office have its own web server? Well, I'll go back to the scenario initially. What did they say to us? Let's go back here. Um, you are in the IT department and provide support to the head office and all its stores. The stores are all networked. They have an intranet and all data is centralized on a server at their head office. Okay, so there they're telling us. So what they are saying is that this intranet that people can access at the value mart when you click on that, remember, it is an internet-like environment, so a web browser will open. I'll be able to access um, everything off this web server. But they they have this because they need to host this website. Okay? So 
<coughs> Sorry. The first mark is going to come from the fact that you're mentioning that a web server hosts websites and handles traffic, uh, traffic to the site. This is why in this scenario, the company has its own intranet and therefore requires its own web server to host that website. Then 8.8, the company also makes use of its own internal wiki site. Explain what a wiki page is. There's your first mark. Explain what a wiki page is. Remember, it is a website that allows for collaborative editing and contribution in creating the web pages and providing information. That is what a wiki is. A website that allows for collaborative editing and contribution in creating web pages and providing the info. That's your first mark. Then they want to know how it might be used at Value Mart. Well, within Value Mart, they might have a suggestions page or a page where you can, um, you know, have a collection of staff information, maybe a monthly magazine, things like that. All right. So that's how you would answer that particular question. Okay. Then 8.9, we're dealing with POS systems. Our and this is 8.9.1, point of sale system. Point of sale. That's what the acronym stands for. Then they mentioned that all the tail points are thin clients. Explain what this means. Now, remember when we have a client server network, the client is accessing the services provided by the server. Okay. In this case, we're talking about thin clients, which means it doesn't have a system unit. All the processing is done on the server. It doesn't contain a hard drive. Um, it's literally just like a screen and a keyboard, and that's it. Everything else, all processing um, is done over the network by the server. And then 8.9.3 give two reasons why companies use POS systems. Well, um, they use them because it is quicker, it is faster, it's more efficient, there's fewer mistakes uh, when you are actually ringing up items at the till, um, you can sort out stock levels automatically as well because all of this is linked to the server. Okay, and then our last page, we finish off now, 8.10. They say you are busy creating a report. So there's my first item, report, based on a recent physical stock take. So they physically counted everything. Each department manager needs to see their stock shortages in a simple grouped way. Look at the screenshot and suggest, first of all, how the report should be grouped. Well, it should be grouped against uh, department. Remember, each department manager needs to see their stock shortages. So I'm going to group it according to department and then shortages. Okay, that's how I get my two marks. In the last two questions, um, how would they know what stock is missing or short? Well, they're going to compare um, what the point of sale system has to say to the physical stock take that was actually done. And then what is 8.10.3? What is the purpose of a report in database programs? Well, the, the purpose of a, of a report is to take what you have in your table or query and just present it in a manner that is easier to read, easier to view, easier to analyze. And guys, that is the June 2021 theory paper, um, the IEB edition. I hope for those who have gone through the DBE video that I did, that you can now see the difference in how questions are asked um, and just see how the level changes. Um, in terms of DBE and IEB. So thank you so much for watching. Hope you guys are going to like, share, subscribe, follow on the TikTok platform as well. Share this with everyone who needs um, to know this and understand these things. And I'll see you in my next videos where I'm going to start hitting up with the practicals.